Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome to Performance Analytics and Reporting Office Hours. Welcome to our new attendees and welcome back for those of you who are joining us again. As we get started, we're gonna run through a couple of intro slides, run through a couple of some logistics and then we'll get into uh, a presentation that we have prepared for you and some info. Um, and then we're gonna open it up to questions, whether related to what we've talked about uh, beforehand or anything else you have to do about any questions you have about performance analytics and reporting. So first of all, this session is for you. It's to expose you to some fresh ideas, give you a deeper, better understanding of some of the features you have access to and give you really practical guidance. Uh, we wanna make sure that you can do some of these things that we're talking about. This session is being recorded as, uh, and will be posted uh, to the community and to YouTube later this evening or, or tomorrow. Um, and as we're going, again, since this is for you, please ask us questions as we're going. We want to make sure you have a really good understanding about what we're talking about. When you are asking us questions, please use the Q&A in Zoom. That allows us to make sure that we are able to answer uh, each question that you have. If you use the chat, sometimes those get lost and we, we don't want to do that. But the Q&A allows us to make sure that we are able to address each and every one of your questions. So today, my name is Adam Stout. I'm an outbound product manager for perform for Now Platform and Now Intelligence covering performance analytics. And our speaker today is Thomas Davis, also an outbound product manager covering Now Platform and Now Intelligence. Um, you've heard from us before, uh, but Thomas has some great, really interesting information for you. I know I learned a lot when I was seeing this before we went go before we got going. Again, these are all recorded. Uh, they're posted in the community, the same place where you registered for this session. You'll see that the recording and the deck that we go through will be posted there as well. If you're looking for any, uh, any additional information, all the previous sessions are there. I believe we have something like a year's worth of sessions now. You can go back, you can watch those, uh, any sessions you missed, you can get the decks, uh, you can get some, uh, the relevant links for them. And you'll also see the next couple of sessions on what we're planning to talk about. As you're looking and you're trying to find more information, we certainly do encourage you to leverage Now Learning. There's a lot, a lot of training out there covering this material. Uh, also, the K20 labs are there. Um, I did find out that the K20 labs are going to be retired at, at some point. Uh, so if you haven't taken advantage of that, you do want to take advantage of that uh, in the near future. Don't wait. They will not be there forever. Uh, so if you have not taken those, please take them. Um, I think we have close to a, a dozen performance analytics and reporting labs in there from K20. Take those, send them to your friends, send them to your family, um, but they're there for you to take, take advantage of. And we also do always wanna recommend that if we don't get to your question or it's something, uh, if we don't get to your question at the end of this, please ask it in the community. If you haven't read this article, it is just a great post about how to write a great question in the community. When you follow these steps, you're gonna get answers. If you don't, if you skip some of these, it sometimes is a challenge to get your question to the right people, um, but some great tips, very short article about how to write a great question to, so that you get the answer you're looking for. All right, now that we've covered uh, some of these logistics, let's, let's get into it. So Thomas, are you there? I'm here. All right, so I'm gonna hand it over to you to talk about simplifying reporting on surveys. Uh, this is a, a kind of a more in-depth to one of the sessions we had earlier about uh, database views and querying related tables. Some of the questions we got from that inspired this and Thomas has put uh, a lot of work in here into this to to really give you some insight about how do we report on surveys it's one of those big challenges we always get um, and I think we're all going to be coming back to this to, to learn how to do it so Thomas over to you okay thanks Adam uh, appreciate it so you can see my screen I'm sharing now right Yep, looks good. Okay, good. So uh, again, my name is Thomas Davis, and uh, today we're going to talk about um, simplifying reporting on surveys, and we have a use case around it that we're we're going to try to talk through today. Um, and like Adam said, this uh, presentation will be attached in a blog uh, in the community when we're done. Um, so if you want to try to follow along um, as you're watching this, you're more than welcome. Uh, but please feel free to sit back and watch uh, because again, everything that's in this will will be in the blog um, as well. So with that, so uh, like I said, so th th we have a use case and this is really not that uncommon. It, it is something that has been asked for uh, quite a few times in the community. And um, I know that uh, I personally have been on 
uh, a call with a customer that was asking for something that was very similar to this. So we thought it would uh, make perfect sense to do, um, you know, an office hours around it to try to give an idea of exactly how that you can do this. So, so our use case is, uh, although survey management gives us the ability to create, manage, and view completed surveys, we need a way where we can see all the survey results for a particular survey. We'd like to have a row showing all data for a particular survey. And is it possible to have a survey question itself as a column header with the results in each row for each survey? So it's kind of thinking about data, um, the survey data insists, itself sort of normalized to say, okay, I want to have, if there's 15 surveys for a particular uh, survey, can, or 15 responses, excuse me, for a particular survey, can I see all of those on one screen, uh, each taking up their own row with all of the answers uh, as you go across and other information. So again, this is something we've been asked for quite a bit. So um, here we go, we're gonna go through that and, and try to figure that out today. So our, our solution for this is we're gonna take the survey assessment data uh, and then we're gonna put it into a database view and then that'll give us the ability to actually see it uh, in a report and potentially report on it on, uh, in different ways as we go through it. So um, for a database view, you do have to be a sysadmin to actually create uh, a database view. So if this is something that you um, want to do after we get done with this office hours, but you're not an admin, then you may wanna get with your admin and share this with them as well and, and talk through with them uh, exactly what you're trying to accomplish uh, with the experience that you gained today in this call yourself. So just some housekeeping. So, you know, we do have survey uh, management that's already out there and we're not, uh, th this is again where you can create, send and collect responses for basic surveys. Surveys are also, um, you know, can be used in the service portal if you install the service widget um, that comes. And as you can see here in the screenshot, there's a ServiceNow doc that uh, you can reference that gives you a, a great deal of information as it relates to service management. So. This call today, the purpose of this call is to show another way to display service survey data. It's definitely not meant to replace anything that is currently within the platform itself. Uh, and then there's of course the link down at the bottom where you can get to that ServiceNow doc that has, has a great deal of great information on it itself. And database views as well. So, you know, having an understanding of database views is also very important. Uh, although it, this does require sysadmin, uh, sysadmin to create, you will need to work with your sysadmin after this office hours to explain how and what your needs um, to happen, what you need to happen inside the database view to accomplish this solution. Uh, so even if you can't create one, uh, it's very important for you to have an understanding around what database views can do. Uh, here's some great links as well uh, to a ServiceNow doc and also a former office hours that we had uh, that talked about querying multiple tables that has really great information about database views uh, themselves. So let's get into actually creating um, our database view. So there are some tables that we're gonna access um, and need inside of our database uh, view and ones that you should become familiar with. So uh, assessment instance, and that's where actually, you know, the surveys themselves are um, housed and uh, all of the surveys and assessments. And I, I know I keep saying survey and assessments, uh, with newer releases, uh, I think they're getting more towards calling them uh, assessments as opposed to survey, but there's probably some legacy out there, so I'll just keep calling them both of those. And then we'll also connect to the assessment instance question table. That's where the questions themselves are for a particular survey. Uh, and then we'll uh, connect to the metric type. And again, this is uh, the particular survey itself, what it is, and then of course it connects to the the questions and then the responses inside of that. So those tables are the ones that we're actually gonna work with today inside of our database view. And again, another great link at the bottom of this slide here that you know, tells you what comes installed um, as it relates to assessments. Uh, and again, a great link with really good information itself. So <clears throat> if you're not familiar with building a database view, uh, and if you are, then this is nothing new to you. So you basically go to, the filter navigator and you type in database views and, um, and then it'll come up with actually all the ones that were there. So again, if you're not an admin, you actually can't see that. When you type that in, you will not see that. Uh, but if you are, then you know that you can go there and type that in. And here is where we'll actually create uh, our database. And this is sort of the first step that we're showing right here in this preview. Uh, we're naming uh, the database uh, survey results demo because that's what we're doing today. 
We give it a label that's more uh, easier to read. And then uh, anytime that you have a description, it's highly recommended that you use that. Um, that sort of goes uh, back to something that I wrote uh, many months ago that talks about descriptions, but you should definitely, anytime that you can maximize a description and help somebody else that's coming in to look, to know exactly what uh, is there, definitely utilize that. So again, this is uh, what our database name is gonna be. So from there, we'll move on. So <clears throat> next, the first thing that you wanna do is you wanna create your first join. So if you click on new, and in this case, we're gonna collect, connect to the assessment instance table, that's gonna be our first join. And then we'll go ahead and give it a prefix uh, of just instance, a short abbreviation of instance, and our order will be 100 and then we'll submit that. So there is no uh, where clause in this very first one, it's just establishing that first connection to the assessment instance table itself. So next, one of the big things that we have to do in order to make this database um, or this view work is we have to grab some sys IDs. Now this itself is um, a little bit time consuming, but uh, at the end of the day, once it's actually created, then we'll have the, you'll have the ability to have this in, in it and it will be there. So the first thing that we need to do is we'll need to grab the assessment metric type uh, sys ID. So we'll go to, and again, this is going directly to um, the table and you could see in the preview there that I actually typed in there um, ASMT underscore metric underscore type dot list and this gets me directly to it. And then I search for, for our demo, we're going to look at service desk satisfaction uh, surveys. So I searched for that and then it came up and I clicked into it. And when I clicked into it, uh, actually, I didn't. I just grabbed the sys ID directly from there, and then I just brought up a notepad or a text editor, whatever you have, and paste that in there because we are going to need it um, later. So if you're familiar with how to actually get to tables, this is all that we're doing right here is grabbing that first um, uh, sys ID, which is the metric type of service desk satisfaction survey. So we know that that's going to be our base point. So next, what we have to do is we, we have to grab the sys IDs for um, our actual questions. So depending on the survey that you use, and um, I know just from talking to previous customers, there, there could be a lot of surveys inside of your instance. There could only be a few surveys inside of your instance. Some surveys have more questions, some have less questions. But at the end of the day, you know, you have to grab the sys ID in order to make it a column, with, which is what we're trying to do we have to actually grab that sys ID. So in this preview here, we're actually showing how uh, we're gonna do that. So and in this case, we're going to the uh, assessment instance question.list table, which is what I'm typing there in the preview. And then when we go there again, same thing, we're gonna search for the um, service desk survey uh, inside of the category column there, and we'll find that. And, and then when it comes back, I went ahead and grouped by the metric uh, because these are results. So rather than seeing the results, I want to see the actual questions. And you can see here I expanded and then I clicked into uh, the particular question, right clicked in the gray banner at the top and I grabbed that same sys ID. And then I went over there and pasted it inside of my notepad um, again. So a lot of work, um, you know, getting these things. But uh, once you see what we're actually able to accomplish with it, it'll make perfect sense. So that's what we'll do there. So there in this particular one, there are six questions. So for the sake of time, uh, and you can see the videos kind of move in here a little bit faster. I went ahead and grabbed all of those particular uh, sys IDs and I have them here in the notepad so we can use those. So now that we have all of those and we've grabbed them, then you'll notice in the next slide, we'll actually go to start building out um, our view because we'll need those sys IDs the metric type one and also the question uh, sys IDs to build our where clause inside of our joins. So once you have all of those, um, then again, we'll be ready to go actually over to the next slide. So in this case, so now we go right back down to view tables. We go back to our, our database view and we go down to view tables and we click new. In this case, we're going to the instant question, which was the same table that we just uh, went to where we grabbed all of those sys IDs. Uh, we give it a prefix, just question one, give it an order. This means this is what we want to grab secondly. And here is the actual um, where clause that is pasted into uh, the database view itself. 
So <clears throat> what, are we, what are we learning inside of this where clause? So the metric type, so we're saying, okay, we need to go to the instant uh, metric type, which was our first join, and we need to you know, grab that particular sys ID, which correlates over to the service, uh, service desk survey, satisfaction survey. And then we say, okay, now that we have that, I need to go to the question um, join, and I need to make sure that our sys IDs match up to the particular question that I'm looking for. So give me the sys ID of the instant metric, which was the first join. Join that to the question one join. It says, I need to look inside of the met uh, metric type table for this sys ID. And then when I find that, I then want to look for the actual question. In this case, question one, which is the sys ID in, in the second part of the view that we have there. So again, this same where clause is what we'll actually use in every one of our joins uh, going forward because it works the same exact way. You just have to make some small minor changes uh, to the where clause itself. So for example, when we go to the second, uh, the second question, it would look just like this, but the, the prefix would say quest two, it would say 300, and then, uh, and then the sys ID for the metric type would stay the same, but then we would go back to our notepad, we'd grab that second question sys ID, and we would pop it into right here where the sys ID is. So that's what you have to do, and you have to do that multiple times. And obviously, you know, if a survey had uh, quite a few uh, questions, then obviously you would be doing uh, that quite a few times. But once you have all the information and do it and doing, you know, copying and pasting, it should make it uh, relatively easy. So you can see here, these are all the other joins that I added into the view. Uh, and then you can see to the right here what the view actually looks like. So you can see that there is a join for every question and then also uh, the very first join which was you know establishing our, our connection to the metric type. So here's exactly what it would look at and you can see minor changes. Uh, everything is the same except for you know the the prefix. It's different all the way down. Our orders are going to be different because we want to get them in the order that we need them and then of course the sys ID that we have in the second part of that where clause is different based on what um, question that we have. So that again, that's all of it. Uh, and for time's sake, rather than me having to do all of those, I went ahead and, and added all those uh, into the join. So <clears throat> when we actually have it all done, now let me back up a minute, because one thing that I, I would definitely suggest to you is that after you've done um, any one of these joins, I would highly recommend that you go ahead and click the try it button, which you can see right here, um, that's basically gonna let you know whether or not what you did is correct. If you had any syntax uh, issues, they'll, it'll actually come up and tell you that you have those syntax issues. So again, you add the first join in, uh, try it, make sure that there's no issues. You add the, the second one in, try it, make sure that you actually get some results back and so on and so forth. That's gonna help you because, you know, if you go through all of those and put them all in and it is um, one particular syntax error, that is wrong uh, and you've copied and pasted, then you, you're going to have to go back to each one of those joins and fix that anyway. So it just makes sense to sort of do that as you go and you'll see that information pop up. If it's correct, you'll see it pop up in the results when you actually try it. So make sure you do that, it's very important. So um, again, we click try it and, and one of the things that you'll notice is you have quite a bit of um, columns of information. So when you click try it, and you click on the cogwheel sprocket where you actually want to personalize your list of what you want to see, you'll see a lot of information and you'll scroll down. Uh, we can't scroll here, but you can see that uh, it's got a, a quite a bit of information. The information that we need for this particular use case is we want the metric type, which is the survey name itself, um, the number, uh, the actual response ID for that particular survey, uh, who it's assigned to, um, created when it was actually created, what state it's in. Uh, maybe they have not finished, they've submitted it or whatnot, um, but they haven't finished it. Most cases, if it's in this, it has actually been finished. And then um, the questions, right? So you can see here that they're all string values uh, because they're, you know, different uh, limits and, and different sizes and based on the question or whatnot. So it's a string field anyway. So it comes back as a string value. So for this particular use case, this is what uh, I've added into it. But again, based on what your use case in is, you can get um, 
you know, all the information out of that that you need. And again, a database view, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but a database view can have everything that you need in there based on the joins. So the joins that we did were really geared around the survey itself, but maybe you want to get more information about the sign too. So maybe you need to add in uh, some sort of join that will give you information about who is actually assigned to. So you can then pull in maybe the manager or the department or the assignment group or things like that. So again, you can add that information into it, but for just this use case, we did not do that. Um, but again, the, these are what we're actually bringing over uh, into the, the results at this point. So um, this is what we would return, right? So when we hit try it now after me adding in my columns, this is what we would get. So we can see here that we have the name and this is the individual response. Uh, this is who it was assigned to. This one was created, completed, um, <clears throat> and then we have our string values. So um, at the end of the day, this actually gives us what the customer was asking for. It gives them the ability to look for survey desk, uh, service desks, uh, satisfaction surveys, and all of the results that are there. We happen to have 16 in my instance, but it would be uh, as many as that they had there. Now you're probably saying to yourself, well, okay, I see string value, but what is that? Because I would expect to see the question, uh, the actual question, so it would make more sense to me and I'd actually get some value. Because I agree, this right here doesn't actually have a whole lot of value. I could tell you that this one allows probably someone to type in it, but I don't know exactly what it is. Uh, some have numbers and there's a yes or no, but it doesn't have everything that we need to get you know better value out of it. So what we can do, and, and there was actually a blog that was wrote uh, a few weeks back that actually showed you how you could customize column headers. And, it, and I would definitely uh, encourage everyone to go to that particular blog and watch that. It has videos in it as well that actually shows you how to do it. Um, and basically what happens in that blog is you create a dictionary relationship between um, the Sys dictionary and um, the database view, uh, not the particular one, but the database view as a whole. And what that then does is it gives you the ability to then give better names for any of those columns that maybe the names are not you know, really working for. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a string value. It can be any one of the columns inside of your database view where you can actually change the name of those where it has more value to you and your particular customer based on whatever your use case is and whatever that uh, you need to be present inside of the results of that database, database view. So I definitely encourage you to go and look at that particular blog so you can learn more about that. So based on that blog, um, what we have here is this is our original um, try it, the results inside the try it inside the database view. We just saw that a few moments ago. Um, and basically th this is what we have at the top, right? Stream value, stream value times six, right? There's six of those, which means absolutely nothing to us. So after you do what's inside of the customizing column headers blog, this is what you then can get. And if we make that bigger, now we're actually able to see that those string values, what exactly they are. Now I actually rearranged these a little bit as well because it just made sense. Once I actually saw the question, I just changed what order they were in. So initially the comments, which again, I sort of just figured this was the first one because it had comments in, I moved that to the end because maybe you wanna read those comments after you've looked at everything else. And these are abbreviations, sort of not really abbreviations, but smaller sort of forms of the particular question. And again, in the blog, what you'll find out is that when you actually hover over them, the hint, which in my case that I did inside of the, uh, the labels that I did for these, I actually put the question itself as the hint. And the hint is basically a hover over. So when you hover over the actual question, it'll give you the entire question uh, as opposed to what we sort of slim this down to be. And we slim this down just because it can get very wide based on how long that a question is, how much information or verbiage is in a question. So again, that's up to you. It just made more sense and it looked better to actually slim that down a little bit. But again, you know, customizing column headers is, um, is very powerful and it gives you the ability to really clean up the data uh, that you're actually getting out of the database view itself.
So, you know, I know that was probably fast and a lot of information, but again, it's directly inside of this office hours and this PowerPoint will actually be saved and it'll be there. The videos will be inside of the blog itself. So you can actually watch those again, maybe at a slower pace and go through them. But in review, we were, actually, we were able to actually give the customer exactly what they were looking for. So we're able to give them the, the solution to their use case. And again, the data that's presented is only limited by the joins that you have inside of your database. Now, I wouldn't tell you to have, you know, 20, 30, 40 views, that's not what I'm saying, because then you can start having some latency issue depending on how much data that's there. But again, if it needs a, a couple more joins so you can, it, pull more data in so it's more valuable to you, then I would definitely highly, highly suggest that you actually do that. And again, with the customization of the column headers, we were really at, you know, able to make that data mean sense to the user and, and again, give them exactly what they were looking for. So, you know, a database view is the right option for this use case, but for other use case, maybe it's not a database view. And that's when I would refer you back to the querying multiple tables office hours that we had a few weeks back. And then there's some different ways even in that that you can actually pull data together and uh, view it as well. So some very good useful links here. So the survey management, which we talked about at the very beginning, this is that same link that's in there. Go there, see everything that is there that you're actually able to get within survey management. Maybe you don't need a database view. Maybe you're able to get everything that you need out of what's already in the platform. And if that's the case, that is awesome. Uh, so go there and definitely look and see what was there. Database views, you know, again, uh, make sure you familiarize yourself with them. And even if you can't create them, it's still a good idea to, you know, to know how to do them. So when you're, you're sitting with your admin or whoever that's going to actually create that for you, uh, you can refer back to this and say, hey, this is that, that doesn't look right. This is actually what it's supposed to look like. And knowing, you know, what a where clause is and a prefix and a label and things like that, it's, it's definitely important. And it never hurts to know more information anyway. Uh, and again, what's installed with the assessment. So go to this link. It lets you know everything that is out there that is installed with the assessments. And it is a great deal of information. And I highly recommend that you look at that. Again, there's the office hours that are the blog, I'm sorry, that I was referenced to with the customizing and the column headers. Uh, go to that. Uh, maybe you already have a database that's out there that you're familiar with. And you, you said to yourself, I really wish the column header was something better. Now here, this, this blog will actually show you where you can do that. So even if it's outside of this particular use case, there's still a lot of value in that as well. And then again, talking about this particular case of database view work, but maybe it's not working for your use case. And the, here, this office hours, the querying multiple tables gives you more um, insight into even more and you know, different ways that you can bring data together based on what your actual use case is. So again, a lot of great information, a lot of great links. Definitely use those. Um, and with that, questions. So please go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A and we can answer them. And, and if they're not related to this, that's fine. Anything dealing with performance analytics and reporting, we're happy to, to talk about. Um, one comment that came in, which I, I wanna chime in on, uh, about customizing column headers. So I, I've been working with ServiceNow for seven and a half years, and I am sure that I have told customers you can't do it because I've asked, people have asked me and I'm like, yeah, can't customize the the uh, the column headers uh, on a view. They just, they are what they are, uh, consistent. You know, they're referenced to, to the real field. So you always know what the real field was. Um, and uh, as Thomas and I were working on, on this solution and uh, Dan Kane as well, which some of you may have seen some of his posts in the community, uh, we were going through it and uh, I think Dan showed us just, no, you just change the label. And it's amazing to me how much you can, how much you can know and how much you can not know about service now. So it's always worth asking again. Um, I, I feel very embarrassed that I didn't know that. Uh, it's really easy. And as Thomas show, wrote, wrote up in the blog and showed it, you can, with a five minutes worth of work by your admin to add the relationship and add it to the view, you can make it super easy to do and make that just a much better experience for your users. So it's a, it's awesome. It's it's so easy and so awesome and powerful. Um, Thomas, I appreciate you you sharing that with everybody else. Yeah, no problem. Um, okay, so again, please go ahead and, and post any questions you have. Uh, another one came in, uh, and I'm just reading it really quickly. Uh, 
So uh, a question came in um, related to performance analytics and the, the workbench view. I, I think they were talking about the workbench widget there. Uh, and the the question had to do with clicking through. On the workbench, we want to go to the to the analytics hub, but in a new window. And is it possible is it possible to um, to configure the on click behavior? And I'm going to answer this very generically and, and and ostensibly no in terms of opening in a new window or not opening in a new window. There are some settings. Um, uh, there, there are some settings to change those things globally. I, I don't really like messing with those because sometimes I want it, sometimes I don't. My preference is that I leave the on click in the window because a user can always right click and open in a new window. But if I force it to a new window, they can't. Um, all that being said, the, the visualizations here are, are good. They're solid. They're what we've used in the classic. The future, one of the things that we all, we should all take a look at is what is coming in workspace. So a lot of amazing things in, in, the, in the now experience and the workspaces that are there where we're, mo we're moving from um, analytics hub to KPI details to analytics setter and KPI details, uh, which are actually two different words instead of the same word for two different things. Um, the future of what you're gonna see is in, is in uh, workspace and all the work we're putting in. So KPI details, analytics hub um, and KPI signals you can see, you should see some of the stuff trickling out now in terms of what's in Paris. Some really, really, really amazing stuff there. Um, I would take a look at it. I'm not sure that you, you, there's a lot to it. So we can't just move there just for analytics. But as we're looking to what are we going to get? Where are we going? Everybody here probably wants to look at what's available um, in Paris. Um, and perhaps as an office hours, we'll go through that to showcase what's there. It is absolutely the future. There's amazing things in there. The customizability of what's in workspace is, is, is phenomenal. And the ability to create custom components and custom visualizations, rather than being kind of a bolt on after the fact, you really can make them in line to what you want it to be. So it's really a good, good point for all of us here to be aware of what's coming in workspace. So over the next uh, few releases, we're able to take advantage of those things. and 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 help move your organization to the now experience in, in workspaces as appropriate. But I'll tell you from, from performance analytics reporting visualizations, everything that you have, at, not everything, many of the things that you've asked for, uh, they're, they're in the workspace version. They're in the, in the now experience version, as opposed to uh, being improved in the classic. We will see improvements in classic. We, we, are, you know, we understand where we're all at with dashboards, but we're re-implementing things to, to address your requests, your concerns, the things that you wanted are, are, are coming in there. So make sure you watch some of those, uh, those showcases, those demos on what you're gonna see in Paris and then coming in Quebec and continuing on. It is, it is really amazing. Okay, another question uh, came in. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow up on, on a question that has to do with, with the workbench widget following the breakdown source elements and the breakdowns on the, and the, breakdowns on the widget stopped working. Um, so this, this is a real issue with, with the workbench widget is, to me, one of the most amazing visualizations. The data density on a, vid, on a workbench is amazing. For the right persona, generally a process owner, the workbench is great. If you're not familiar with it, make sure you go look up the workbench widget. But one of the things with the workbench widget is it, it can get you into trouble because it, the workbench itself has two levels of breakdown. And so if you add a breakdown on the dashboard, you end up with three levels. So the, the thing you need to be aware of if you're using the workbench widget is one, make sure you are collecting the matrix because the workbench itself has two levels of breakdown. So every indicator you show needs to have two levels of breakdown. You need to collect the, the matrix. The most common issue I see is people don't collect the matrix and then data doesn't show up because there's no data to show. And if you need the third level, you actually can get a third level effectively um, in a workbench. Um, you got to make sure that you don't have, uh, you can't show the third level. You can't collect the third level. So you have to make sure that you're structuring your, uh, you have to create additional indicators. So generally the chevrons on the workbench, you're not going to just use the plain indicator, but you'll create an addition, additional indicators. Um, if you have a question on, on how to do this, I'd recommend posting in the community because it's fairly specific to the configuration on what's going wrong. 
There's a few things that are coming in. Um, but again, the matrix is the most common thing. Uh, second to that, it's the third level. And if you, if you have the third level, uh, if you post a screenshot of what you're trying to do, we might be able to have some suggestions on, on how to approach it. But you can get it to work. We absolutely do get it to work. Um, and it's amazingly powerful um, when, when it's configured uh, to get what you want. Okay. So the next question uh, that came in, uh, how does the left join work on a database view? So um, the left in database views, in database views, the default is inner join. So you have to have records in both tables. The, if you add, if you, I, what I generally do is personalize the view, the related list views to add left join so that I don't forget it. But you can set the left join and left join is, is a traditional left join. It means the, the, you have to have records in, on the left side of the join on the main table, um, what comes the order before it, but on the right side, there can optionally not be data. So that's important for the surveys in that if you have questions that may not be answered, if you don't left join, you would only get those res you'd only get rows back when every single answer was filled out. There was an entry for everything. If you might have some that are filled out, some that, that don't because there was branching or um, I, I don't know if we actually store the blanks, the blank answers or not, then you'd want to left join so that you'd always have, you'd want to, you'd want to have the main table be the assessment because there has to be an assessment, there has to be the survey, but then every answer you're joining to, you'd want to left join. Um, there is no right join uh, and left join and right join are logically effectively the same. It's just the order you put them in, but there is no right join and there is no cross join. You can't say a table, uh, you can't join the records in A or B that aren't in common. You do have to join, join one. We only support left joins, inner joins and left joins, which covers most, but not all use cases. Um, but make sure you check that box. And again, I personalize the related list to always show me the left join so I don't forget it because otherwise I forget it and I get weird results. And as Thomas said, uh, he mentioned it a couple times. We can mention it a couple times more. Every time you mess with a view, press try it because you never know if you, you know, you mix a single quote and a double quote, or you had some small typo, particularly when we're dealing with sys IDs. So just always quick try it and that you're continuing to get data. That's generally, if you don't know when you should left join and when you shouldn't left join by clicking try it every time when you have data and then all the data disappears, that's probably a good time to check a left join. So clicking try it is, is just incredibly important uh, to keep you sane. Okay. And again, please continue to, to push, submit your questions if you have any more. Um, a question that came in was, are we going to cover PA for CMDB later? Um, we certainly we certainly can. We can put that on the list uh, of things of things to cover. You, you certainly can run CM, uh, CMDB and uh, PA for CMDB. There are a few content packs that come available for, for uh, uh, CMDB that, that are available, specifically focusing on health. Um, some of the things that come out as well, I, I believe with the CMDB content packs, um, there are some indicators that are shipped that aren't actually put on a dashboard, but they're there. So I know when I focus on health, there are indicator out of the box indicators for CMDB health. Um, I, I would look at those even if they're not on the dashboard. And CMDB, one of, I, I, one of the things, things to bring up is CMDB it, it does have some challenges. Um, and the main challenge is you, we, the level of breakdowns. So for CMDB, you can't really break down on CI, the CI itself, which is, which is legitimate on why I'd want to do that. But we don't support breaking down on a million elements, which I can easily have a million CIs. Um, but you can break down by CI class. Um, and that I, I, you certainly can break down on CI class. And one of the big things, um, uh, uh, good question that came in too. Uh, one of the big things with this is that PA um, you used to have some more uh, challenges with large data sets and out of the box, we restrict our indicator sources to um, 50,000, about 50,000 records and everybody's CMD, CMDB is bigger than 50,000 records. So it would say, I'm not collecting anything because it's too big. Um, in Paris, there were some changes. So there was some optimizations done to the data collector, which allows us to go well beyond 50,000. The default is still 50,000 because logically for many of the things we want to do, 50,000 is enough. Um, having 50,000 open incidents is a lot, not for all of us, but for, for many of us. Um, so the 50,000 is still there, but what you're able to do in Paris 
is to set for specific indicator sources, like my active CIs, I can set that from 50,000, I could set it to 10 million. There still are some restrictions when we get to the breakdowns and, and some things that come in. But um, if I'm simply looking for account by CI class, um, particularly if I'm not doing uh, the matrix for, for CMDB, uh, it depends on the number of scores you're getting to, but um, you can for those, for a specific indicator source, change that limit from 50,000 to 10 million. Prior to Paris, you could do it, but you have to change the global setting and now you no longer have to do that. So we can be a lot safer and a lot smarter and do a lot more with CMDB that we were not able to do in the past. Um, when, uh, so the follow-up question to this, and I think we'll, we'll leave CMDB after, after this. Uh, uh, the last part of this has to do with, with uh, query results. Um, Thomas, I believe you talked about this before. You wanna um, uh, briefly talk about PA for CMDB query results? Oh, you're talking about based on the former um, office hours that we had? Yeah. Yeah, so, so we did a, um, an office hours, a, um, again, a few weeks back where we actually um, used the CMDB query builder and we were building um, queries inside of that that we then used inside of um, PA itself. So if you're, if you're not familiar with that and you want a really good um, you know, office hours and some videos as well, uh, I would definitely suggest you go out to the community and find the um, building performance analytics with um, query. I have to look it, look it up exactly it is, uh, what I, the name of it is. Yeah, well, but well, uh, I think it was uh, it was in July or or August is when it was. And again, it gives some really good information into uh, actually doing that. And there is a use case in that that we did as well, and walk through the entire process of actually building. Um, using the CMDB query builder in that as well. So definitely hit up the community um, and uh, you can get that. And I actually try to grab that real quick and maybe put it I, in the chat. I grabbed it. I'll, I'll, I'll put that in the chat. Oh, okay, uh, good. Let me uh, put that to everybody and we'll, we can put that link out as well. Um, it is. It was August 12th, leveraging CMDB query builder and reporting. Um, and similar to the use case today, I get Thomas gets all the hard ones. Um, it's actually not that hard, but it's not intuitive. So whether it's watching, rewatching the session today or watching the session on the query builder, um, once you know how to do it, it's, uh, it's not that difficult to do. Um, and CMDB, I will, I will add that the, the out of the box content packs are fine, but they're not everything you'd want them to be. Um, so that's certainly something, there are some new content packs, I, I believe. Uh, so you wanna look at what's out there. You can do more than what we do in the content packs. And you'll see a lot of what we're doing with CMDB uh, manifests itself in, in the other, in other content packs. So um, security ops and vulnerability response leverages a lot of CMDB. So we're, we're looking to incorporate CMDB and then specifically uh, CSDM into more of the content packs. But as, as we're going through, we, we build a lot of new content packs. The old ones um, may not take advantage of all the features that we're able to get to in Paris um, because that content pack might've been done a release or two ago. So you can certainly enrich them. And we are continually to go back, going back to enrich the, the old stuff as well. Um, and it is important when we, with content packs and upgrading, uh, it's something that comes up. When we upgrade content packs, we can't just, we're, we're not gonna just change what you have, particularly if you've, if you've already customized it. We can't change your job if you've already set the user and set the time. Um, maybe you change the days that, that it's looking at. We can't change, we're not going to change your indicator source when you've already added an additional condition. So because of that and, and how you use analytics and right or wrong, we can't change it from underneath you. It's not like just changing the logic in a business rule, but the analytics, uh, we can't, we just, we take the position, we can't change them from underneath you. Um, because of that, some of the upgrades you may not see. So it is, it is always good if you're focusing on a certain area, when a new release comes out like Paris, go take a look and look at the documentation for the content packs you already have. Um, and whether you're using the solution library to upgrade or you just get some ideas and, and lift something or you get a, a personal developer instance and, and uh, install the fresh content pack, take a look at what's there and how, how we're improving. Um, we are certainly learning along the way. Uh, we get a lot of feedback from everybody else about what's useful and what's not useful. Um, so make sure that, uh, uh, that you're looking at what's out there, take advantage of that, take advantage of the release notes to just quickly browse what those new solutions are and updated solutions as well. 
because just because it's updated doesn't mean it's going to be upgraded in your instance because we respect your analytics enough not to just change them without your, without your knowledge about it. Um, okay, uh, and, and one kind of general question, another question that came in uh, had to do with what's the difference between an indicator, the conditions on an indicator source versus conditions on each indicator. Um, and this is, uh, th there's a big difference between these. So your indicator source is what we're pulling back from the, uh, the database. It is the, the superset of your data and your indicator has, can have additional conditions to filter it. So my general guideline, the general guideline I have has to do with, I should, if I have an, a, a condition that is on every indicator, on the indicator source, it shouldn't be on the indicator, it should be on the indicator source. I also, vast majority of the time is, um, sorry, if you have a condition that is on every indicator in your indicator source, it should be on your indicator source, not on each indicator. That, that's not a rule of thumb, that's just how it should be, it's, it's more efficient. Um, the second rule of thumb that I use is, every indicator source should have at least one indicator that has no additional conditions. There are a couple of exceptions to this, but generally that rule serves me really, really well. Because if every indicator has additional conditions, then maybe I need to indicate two indicator sources. Um, the, except, the main exception is the data is all mutually exclusive. So if I'm looking at SLAs that breached today or SLAs that were due today, well, that is, a, that is the set and every record is either gonna go, it either breached or didn't breach. Um, although generally I'll have a third indicator, I'll have three indicators on that. Total, breached, not breached. Um, it's pretty simple, pretty simple to have there. And then again, I have my rule that I should always have an indicator that has no additional conditions. Um, the worst thing you can do, and I, I have seen this, is that somebody will have an, indi an indicator source, which is all incidents, no filters, all incidents, and then they have an indicator that has additional conditions closed on today. What that means is I'm pulling back and processing hundreds, maybe thousands of times the amount of data. My job just runs longer. It, it, there's no benefit. It's just extra overhead and extra time. So make sure your indicator sources um, are as, as tight as they can be with the amount of with the data you want. Every row in my indicator source, I want to be going into one of my indicators. Um, which again, the easy way is if I have at least one indicator that has no additional conditions, I know that's true. Okay, a good question and really important to understand about where we're processing it. So again, indicator source gives me all my data back and then I'm applying a second level of filtering to my indicator. If it is not in the indicator source, it will not be in the indicator, right? So it, it's a two-stage filtering process. Um, and then a follow-up, if, if additional conditions used for multiple indicators with the same indicator source, it will take longer to collect. Um, the, the, the actual processing of the additional conditions is incredibly lightweight. Um, so I, it, that shouldn't um, hit you, but it has to do with the number of rows that are processed as your, your biggest indicator and scripts. The, the, slow, the thing that will slow your jobs down the most is scripts. Uh, second to that is uh, is the amount of data. Um, the easiest thing is make sure you're not, you're not pulling back data in your indicator source that you don't need. So you always want to take a look at that is do I need every row I'm pulling back? And in the same vein, am I pulling back all incidents this month? Do I really need that? Or can I do all incidents this day, run it daily, and then use a time series? So the smaller amount of data that, that we, the, you know, we don't want to reprocess the same thing over and over and get the same result. So the number of incidents open today, whether I do it monthly or I do it daily and sum it up monthly, it doesn't make a difference. It, it just doesn't make a difference. Um, and there are, there are some things we get into scale and what we wanna do, but ostensibly just make, you know, I want daily indicators. I only want data for that day. It's always a manageable amount um, and it should run fast. I, I want my jobs to run in really 10 minutes or less, 15 minutes or less. I get concerned when I have multi-hour jobs um, with the exception of I'm running CMDB and I'm running 10 million records, that takes a little bit of time. That, that I may not be able to get through that in 10 minutes, but um, 
most of my jobs I want to see running in 10 to 15 minutes or less and often in the or less category. Okay, a few more minutes. Uh, and hopefully this is, this is helping all of you. Please go ahead and uh, submit any other questions that you have. Um, we have a few more in the queue. Ah, really, really good question. Um, I'm seeing these all as uh, anonymous, so I don't know if these are all the same person or not, but a question having to do with upgrades. Um, in upgrades, we're, we're getting ready to get started with PA. Um, and welcome to our office hours. Thank you for, for uh, learning a little bit about it before you dig into it. Would it make sense to upgrade first? Yes. The simple answer is yes. Um, personal developer instances are awesome because you can go play around with something is the way I would look at it, right? Explore it, see what's there and not be afraid about what's going on. Um, on your sub prods, you certainly can, you can see what's going on, but uh, we, there are lots and lots of updates. Uh, I believe our last office hours, we talked about the new content packs that are out there and content packs that get upgraded. And up, uh, once you've activated a plugin, the, the trap we can run into is I activate a content pack and then upgrade, I might miss something. So don't activate content packs until you're ready to really look at them. And if you have an upgrade coming, um, you can look at the documentation to see if it's been touched, if it's been updated. Um, but if I didn't know and I had the ability, I would wait until I upgrade, at least on my sub prod, to understand what's going on. Because um, that way I make sure I get the latest and greatest. And again, we're, there are new, there is an amazing amount of content produced every each and every release that just gets there's more and more. So before you start building with PA, make sure you look at what's available to help you get started. It might get you everything you need. There's some amazing content packs. Some of them are, some of the solutions we have are just more customized. It's always customized. So some of them might get you 80% there, but 80% there is a lot better than no, you know, than zero. So make sure you look at those content packs. Also make sure you look at the, the community posts that we have about getting started and all the available training that's out there, all that stuff in, um, in the community, all, all the amazing stuff they're now learning. So lots of great content there. Um, but if I had the choice, don't turn a content pack on until you're ready. And if you're about to upgrade, upgrade first. Um, and I'm going to answer, uh, we have time for one more question and then we'll wrap up having to do with um, create, when does it make sense to create more indicator sources to reduce the amount of indicators sharing the same source? Generally, you want to combine all your indicators into the same source that gives you uh, the same result set because the data can change from underneath it can change from underneath you. So the, the data will be more consistent when it's all in one indicator source. And it also means I only have to run one query to the database to pull the data back. Um, so if you break your indicators into separate sources or put them into separate jobs, um, generally what I would do is use the same indicator source, but just put them in separate jobs. We can reduce the amount of memory we use, but your cumulative time will actually go up. So instead of having one 20 minute job, I might have two 15 minute jobs. Um, that's needed at some point in time, but generally we're, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna default to including things that logically belong together into the same indicator source, into the same job. So they run at the same time and I have more consistency and it's just easier to manage and better. When we hit some levels of, of scale, um, we might break them into separate jobs. Um, and again, I still don't actually need separate indicator sources, but separate jobs. So I only have one thing to manage instead of two things to manage. Um, and I keep them logically connected. And the jobs, they can generally run par in parallel. You just want to make sure you don't, you want to run them a minute or two apart. So they, they load balance to different nodes on your instance. If you fire a bunch of jobs in the same second at the exact same minute, um, they can all go to the same node. They actually probably will go to the same node which can then cause problems. But if you stagger, even by a couple minutes, the, the jobs can go out. But all that has to do with when there is a problem, let's talk about that problem. Um, outside of that, I want it to be in the same indicator source in the same job. It's easier to manage, it's easier to understand, uh, it's easier to operate. And only when I have an issue would I then go to, to breaking things apart. Okay, um, we're, uh, we're running low on time. Um, I appreciate all your questions, great, great stuff. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and bring up a couple slides to help us wrap up here.
Okay, and again, thanks Thomas for the, the great demo. I love to see how you explain it. It's, uh, it's really helpful to see, to see how do I navigate through these things. Okay, as a reminder, as we go through, uh, this session was recorded. We will get it posted uh, once we get the video ready, so it should be later this evening. Um, and we'll get the recording posted. It'll be on YouTube if you subscribe to that channel, which you can, you can do here. Um, and in the community, the post will be there along with, with uh, Thomas's deck. So I know that's really useful to reference. A lot of great links in there, which aren't necessarily the easiest to remember, but when you have the link, it's easy to copy and paste. And those links will be in that post as well. So uh, check back tomorrow and you should be able to get this session, share it with your friends. Next time, next time we're going to talk about predictive intelligence. So we focus a lot on performance analytics and reporting, um, but many of us, if we have um, one of our pro packages, also have access to predictive intelligence, a great complement to performance analytics. Um, it's not uh, uh, performance analytics or predictive intelligence or reporting. They all complement each other. And we're going to talk a little bit about what do you get with predictive intelligence for those of us that have entitlement to it? What's it going to help us do? And what do I get out of box? Um, we're not going to go through a bunch of training, but we just want to make sure we're all exposed to what's there. Um, and again, I know a lot of us have entitlement to it, so we should be looking at it to help, help us solve some of those problems. Some of those really difficult things to solve with performance analytics are easy to solve with predictive intelligence. So we'll be going through that in two weeks. Um, this session was a, a pretty direct result from customers asking questions uh, to us directly in the community following up to the session of, uh, a couple months ago. Um, keep telling us what you want to hear. You know, we're, we are here to answer your questions to help you succeed. We cannot succeed unless you do. Um, there is a post uh, linked off of the office hours page for you to put in your suggestions. So I know we got a couple of them here. Uh, we'll, we'll take note of those, but you can go ahead and go in the, in the, um, uh, go into the community, get the old office hour sessions and also suggest new ones for us that, that we can present to you. And until next time, Use the community, share your expertise. We have some of the world's experts on the phone that we're not talking, that we're listening in. Um, please share your expertise and leverage the expertise of, of ServiceNow. Uh, Thomas and I are there. Thomas is answering questions all day long nowadays. Um, a lot of great partners, a lot of other customers. So share and leverage your expertise. So you have a question, ask it there. Um, that, that post that I referenced at the beginning, you'll, you can find that on the community. If you follow those, you're going to get better answers. Just you're gonna you're gonna get more concise answers faster. Um, I my suggestion is always use screenshots, but lots of great things in there. Uh, catch up on the previous office hours. So I think in this session we've re referenced uh, two or three previous sessions. Those are there for you, along with the, re the recordings, the decks, a quick recap of what's there, and a great content for you to, to go back to. Uh, performance analytics reporting, predictive intelligence service now is not perfect yet. We're not we're not there but we can get there with your help. So make sure you're submitting ideas in the portal. Um, you know, you ask a question, how do I do this? And your answer is you can't, that's not the end, right? If you think, yeah, but I wanna do this, please go into the idea portal, which is at the top of the community and submit your ideas. If you have a few minutes, go look through those ideas and, and vote up the ones that other people have submitted if they're gonna help you. Um, we, we do consistently look, look, look at the idea portal. Um, we're planning the next release right now. And those things that, that you guys say you want, of course, we're going to listen. Um, so please use the idea portal. That is that is your best mechanism to get things in the product to help you succeed. And take some training. Um, so again, lots of free and self-paced training and now learning. Um, you can revisit outside of performance analytics. Go. You can expand what you're doing, whether it's ServiceNow fundamentals, virtual agent fundamentals, predictive intelligence fundamentals. Um, every subject area has that. There's just so much training, and they vary from a five-minute class. Um, a five minute kind of point class on what you want to do to a three day session. Um, everything in between and most of it is self paced. Uh, and the self paced stuff is, is for the time being free as far as I know. Um, so just take advantage of that. You can, you can learn so much. The K20 labs are there. They will not be there forever. Um, it's been clarified to me. They will not be there forever. So if you haven't taken advantage of those, please go take advantage of those. All right. And I think with that, we're going to wrap up. Uh, thank you for taking the time to listen. Thank you for the excellent questions today. I really appreciate that. Um, pushing us uh, helps everybody. So I'm glad for that feedback. And we look forward to seeing you in two weeks. Thank you again, Thomas. Really appreciate that presentation. Yep. Thank you. Ed.